and welcome on this beautiful resurrection morning. John eleven twenty five 25 through 27. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. You may be seated. It's almost 2,000 years later, Jesus looks you and me in the eye, making the same claims and asking the same question. Sooner or later, you need to decide whether or not to allow the crucified, risen Jesus Christ to be your personal Lord and Savior. Many of us have already made that decision. Today, we celebrate the most epic event in all of human history. The life, death, and resurrection of the creator, sustainer God who came to earth in the person of Jesus Christ to die for yours and my sins and to raise from the dead in victory over both sin and death, offering you and me eternal life for this life and for the life to come. Do you believe this? Do you know that this to be true? Have you repented of your sins and put your trust in him alone for salvation? Do you trust him as your personal Lord and Savior? For 31 years, I have been a teacher in the public education system. I believe with every fiber of my being that God can use good questions to lead people to the truth of who he is. However, I do not believe that anyone will ever be argued to heaven. That is a work of the Holy Spirit on our depraved minds and our depraved hearts. This morning, I would like to talk with you honestly about some of these basic questions that frequently get tossed around. Maybe you have even heard, heard them before or asked them yourself. I could spend a month of Sundays trying to answer each and every one of these questions individually. These are big questions and not easily resolved. But ultimately, by the end of the day, you have to make a decision whether or not to receive Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord of your life. I do not claim to be a skilled apologeticist. There are many who are more proficient in this field than I. But let's take a look and see what we find. The first question, is there really a God? That's the starting point, isn't it? If there is no God, then the gig is up. I'm a fool to be wasting my time standing up here doing what I'm doing. If it's all an accident anyway... I may just as well do as the Epicureans would say, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow you may die. Do you realize, though, that you are a miracle? The very fact that you are sitting here right now is a miracle. You see, when you, yet while you were still in your mother's womb, and you were being knit together by God himself. You had a hole in your heart. It's called the fossa ovalis. It's found, if, if you think about the heart, it has four chambers. It's kind of like a box made into four parts. And in the top two chambers, there is a hole between the two atriums. And so when the blood comes in to the right, the, uh, right ventricle or right atrium, the blood is already oxygenated. You see, while you were still fully dependent upon your mother for life, your, body, your blood didn't have to be oxygenated. 
It came in through the umbilical cord already oxygenated. So the blood didn't have to go to the lungs to be oxygenated by your body. Instead, it came in and went straight over to the next chamber where it went down through the rest of the body. Uh, enough blood went through into the lungs in order to allow them to grow and to develop. But at the moment that that hole in your fetal heart was formed, amazingly enough, there was also a flap that was formed at the same time. And at the moment you took your first breath, <gasps> that flap closed due to a pressure differential in the heart, allowing your heart to function the way it should. As we take a look at the intricacies of how we are made. We cannot but see God's handiwork in all that is around us. And so we need to remember that however uh, written in the very nature of who we are as human beings is a sense of the divine a cross-shaped void in the heart of every individual that can only be filled by the creator, sustainer God of the Bible who came in human form as a redeemer in the person of Jesus Christ and is present in the lives of all who follow him in the person of the Holy Spirit. There is at the heart of every human being a God-sized vacuum filled only by one distinct from us who has power over us. In my moments of doubt, when I am inclined to question my own personal experiences with God, I still have to confront the intellectual conviction that all that is couldn't have just happened. It could not have happened by chance in the human body, in the cosmos, in the universe, the earth, or in nature. All this couldn't have just happened by chance. The continuance of it without our planet being in its perfect location, either too far that we would freeze or too close that we would burn up. we see a clear, intelligent designer. Do you see it? And every day, do you see it? I see a watch laying on a counter and intricate in its design. I may never meet the watchmaker, but I've got to believe that there is one. The chances of anything as complex as the human body happening to evolution to evolve by evolutionary chance without a creator designer has less chance than, as one observer stated, a tornado hitting a print shop and throwing all the type into the air and bringing it down in a fashion that goes through the processes and comes out with a fully bound edition of Webster's Unabridged Dictionary. There are far too many miracles that occur within our world and our life around us. The Bible state, uh, states it succinctly. Genesis 14.1 reads, fools say there is, in their hearts there is no God. Question number two, who is the true God? The Bible says there is one God who reveals himself and functions in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. 
Genesis 1 says that in the beginning, God created all that is. The very spirit of God hovered over the face of the deep. In the New Testament book of John, the Bible declares that Jesus Christ was present in the creation. It declares in John 1, 1 through 5, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through Him, and without Him not one thing came into being. What has come into being in him was life, and the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. The Apostle Paul states, this magnificent, makes this magnificent statement of the divinity of Jesus Christ in these words. He is the image of the invisible God. The firstborn of all creation. For in him all things in heaven and on earth were created. Things visible and invisible. Whether thrones or dominions or rulers or powers. All things have been created through him and for him. He himself is before all things. And in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. So that he might come to have first place in everything. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. And through him God was pleased to reconcile to himself all things whether on earth or in heaven, by making peace through the blood of his cross. Colossians 15 through 20. This is the one true God. The next question, can I know this God personally? Yes, by all means. He is the Savior God who wants to have a relationship with you. The most basic statement of the Bible is John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. Jesus said, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. John 10.10. In Hebrews 4:14 4, through 16 we read since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens Jesus the son of God let us hold fast to our confession for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with us with our weaknesses but we have one who in every respect has been tested as we are yet without sin Let us therefore approach the throne of grace with boldness so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Yes, you can know God personally. That's what historic Christianity is all about. The glory of Christmas and of Resurrection Sunday is that God has broken into human history, wrapping his arms around you and me and reconciling us to himself through Jesus Christ. The next question, can I really be forgiven? Many people are dealing with guilt. They are dealing with broken relationships they want healed. Some believe that they have to clean up their lives before they can come into a relationship with Jesus Christ. Or worse, they believe that God can't forgive them for the things they have done. If you are one of these individuals, it is my privilege to share with you the, God, the good news of, the, of salvation, which follows the bad news of the human predicament. 
We are created in the image of God to live a full and meaningful life. Things have gone wrong in everyone's life. The Bible says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and that the wages of sin is death and that this death is a spiritual separation from God in this world and in the life to come. But that's not the end of the story. God became a man in the person of Jesus Christ to offer forgiveness. That's the good news. 1 Peter 2.24 reads, He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that free from sins we might live for righteousness. By his wounds we have been healed. Christ died for all sins. The ones you think you have to clean up before coming to Christ and the ones you think you can't be forgiven for. He even died for my sins, like the sin of pride, prideful, selfish righteousness. When I think I have not committed any of those sins, the fact is that Jesus had greater problems with people like me, who were self-righteous religious leaders who thought of themselves as being better than adulterers, murderers, liars, and cheats. All of us need the embrace of God's forgiveness. All of us need to remember 1 John 1, 8 through 9. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he who is faithful and just will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Jesus came to offer forgiveness. The price that forgiveness is caught <clears throat> the price is that forgiveness is costly. That's what the cross is all about. Michael and Robert Shannon in their book Celebrating the Resurrection observed that John Woden, the famous UCLA basketball coach, always kept a cross in his pocket. He says he keeps it there to remind himself that there is something more important in life than basketball. What's most important in your life? What to you is the equivalent of what basketball has been to John Woden? Are you willing to acknowledge that the cross of Jesus Christ and the empty tomb are more important than anything else? On the basis of what God has done for you, <clears throat> you are privileged to have forgiveness from him and to forgive others and to be free to allow others to forgive you. Bill Flanagan in his uh, div divorce recovery workshops says that the major breakthrough <clears throat> For persons recovering from the brokenness and the pain of divorce is the willingness to forgive the former spouse, even if that former spouse doesn't think they need forgiveness. Forgiveness is critical for life. The life and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ enables you to be a forgiven person and a forgiving person. There are a few warnings that need to come with this message. First, don't just take what you like about the Bible and reject the rest. Remember, this is the whole counsel of God. If you live by it, acknowledging just some of what is in it, you will never understand that you and I are not God. Second, let God be God. It is the Christian faith, not the Christian proof. You will never understand it all here on earth. Third, don't put off the opportunity to receive Jesus Christ right here and right now. 
you do not know whether or not you will ever have this opportunity again. Every Resurrection Sunday, people are called to faith in Jesus Christ. Some do receive Christ and their lives are changed. Other, <clears throat> others refer to... <clears throat> Allergies. <laughs> Some do receive Christ and their lives are changed. Others I refer to as overwhelming Christians. They come to church when the feeling overwhelms them. Easter and Christmas. They come to church and uh, they simply smile and say hello at the door. In verbal and nonverbal ways, they say, great service, see you at Christmas. Somehow oblivious to the fact that the celebration of Christ's death and resurrection has a very real meaning 365 days a year. And for all 24 hours of each of those days. It is a life in which you and I walk in a daily relationship with Christ. Jesus looks at you in the eyes, <clears throat> you and me in the eyes, and makes this claim to the resurrection and the life. And then he asks you, do you believe this? The question is just what is your answer? Today is the day to think about what is your answer. We have the opportunity to come before the creator of the universe himself and to be able to surrender ourselves, our lives, our will, and our way to the one who truly knows what's going on. That's what the word sovereign means. Our God is a sovereign God. He is in control of all things at all times. And you and I are just trying to figure out the real meaning of that three-letter word, all. Tim, if you'll come and close us in prayer. <clears throat>